Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one. Bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening. And preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning. And have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a bonus episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists podcast. My name is Andrew Johnston. In today's show, you will hear from Heather Jackson from Dents by Serona, and we will talk about something that has been a hot topic for quite some time, clear liner therapy and how to implement it into your office. Ortho is a critical part of dental hygiene, and I don't think that we pay nearly enough attention to it or give it the importance that it deserves. And we talk about this a little bit later on in the episode, but even getting used to the scanning software and doing scans for early detection of changes in the oral cavity is absolutely key. And we should really consider implementing this into our practices so that we can prevent some serious restorative needs later on. Heather does a really good job of explaining it. She was an absolute joy and I cannot wait to have her back again. So please enjoy this episode with her in partnership with Dents by Serona. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome in listeners to the interview portion of the podcast. We are here with Heather Jackson. I'm really excited to speak about this. Clear liners is is something that our hygienists do day in and day out. I think it though is that's not the norm. I think that's a little bit maybe unusual for hygienists to be like the drivers of clear liner therapy. And so I'm really excited to have you on today. Thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for welcoming me. Okay. So if you will just start off with like the very traditional like who are you? Where are you from? All that kind of stuff. Sure. And then we'll get into the good stuff. Sure. My name is Heather Jackson. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I am come from many years in the aligner space. I currently work with Dentsply Serona as a product sales manager for the aligner space. And we're passionate about hygienist participation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me your, your role as it relates to clinicians. Like how what kind of conversations do you get to have with them day in and day out with your role? So as, as our team is out in the field meeting with customers of the Dentsply product line, we meet with the hygiene team, we meet with the dental assistants, and we also meet with the doctors in helping them develop processes in their practice to educate the patient's chair side and bring awareness to the need of form and function and solving it with aligners, as mm-hmm. well as really helping them put the process in play and following up with them and engaging with them, sometimes training them and also giving them more education because it's our understanding that the hygienist doesn't get a lot of orthodontic training, if any. Uh, not, not hardly <laughs> at all. I mean, I mean, I'm mean, i thinking about that one mini chapter in hygiene school that we might've talked about. Hey, by the way, there's a specialist called an orthodontist and they'll take care of everything. I mean, this is, you know, back before I think the big boom of, of clear liners therapy. So you know, I think maybe there might be maybe a bigger chapter now than there used to be. Yeah, I, don't know, in I mean, books. I think there's a national statistic in the U.S. that there's what 350 million people, and of which two to three percent of them seek orthodontic care. So there's a huge opportunity because 73 percent of them have some degree of malocclusion, and they're just not mm-hmm. aware of it. And so, as a hygienist, how do you make them aware of it? How do yeah. you show them? Yeah. How do you educate them? How do you give them reason to believe that you can keep your teeth as long as you want them? Can I ask you, this might be a little bit personal. We can cut this if you don't like it, but you know, I understand why hygienists, dentists, even dental assistants, uh, sterilized tech, doesn't matter who, everyone in the office can be excited about clear liner, but you personally, like, why are you like so excited and passionate about educating clinicians about this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I am of the age where my grandparents had dentures and my grandfather used to thrust his upper arch out at him and scare us during Christmas. <laughs> Classic. And, you know, and then they would, of course, as he matured through life, he lost them. Mm -hmm. And then he passed away Mm -hmm. from cardiac and many, many other things, double bypasses, triple bypasses later. Mm -hmm. And he was a pharmacist. He had the clinical bandwidth and the medical bandwidth to know that, yes, smoking and drinking and all that lifestyle, but there was more to it than that, that he didn't have to die with dentures. He didn't have to go through cancer with a straw and having all of his 
food pureed. Mm. And so it was one of those things that once I started getting and learning more from either the dentist, either the hygienist or the orthodontist of how to protect and preserve those teeth in that form and function for life. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you go with your grandparents and you see them in assisted living or you see them in other capacities where they got to cut it up so small just to be able to suck on it for the next 20 minutes before it breaks down. What other joys do we have as we mature through life than chewing our food? And spending time with yeah. our family. And so I did not know that that this was a space where you could help people have their natural dentition for life. Mm -hmm. And so there's a mindset in my mind that's like, how long do you want to keep your teeth? Mm -hmm. And if so, mm -hmm. it's your job as a hygienist, your job as a doctor and the clinician to help them do that. And have conversations to help them make choices to do that. Have you heard have you heard very many clinicians talk about okay, we're only going to use clear liner therapy for children or not children, but you know, like the teenage years, um, we're not going to do it for adults and, and things like that. Have you heard that, that notion? Yeah. So both of my children went through a phase one, phase two with orthodontics. So skeletal for the first phase, and they only wanted to do it with brackets and wires. However, my daughter was seven, not the most compliant hygiene person, not the most compliant at anything. <laughs> I felt as a parent, that was the wrong choice for her. Sure. So how can we have some sort of device? Now, granted, there's compliance on the removable piece, but how mm -hmm. can we have some sort of a device that helps her do this while still making her feel good about herself while she's enduring it and she's got a diastema the size of a truck stop? And how do we help her physically go through the hardest part of her life as a young woman, as a young lady, as a young girl, where she still feels good about it, she still can get the care that she needs, and it was a better solution for us. But I, as the parent, had to advocate for her. Mm. I, as the parent, had to say, I know there are other options out there. Mm -hmm. We don't have people that are aware of that. They walk into the doctors every day, and they expect them to provide them the options. They expect them to provide the solutions or possible solutions. And so oftentimes doctors would say, well, I, I, aligners don't work. Is it really the aligners don't work or the aligners don't work in your hands? Because I know doctors I could give aligners to, and they could do amazing things. And then there are doctors that I could give brackets and wires to, and they could do amazing things. And it takes that self-discovery, that self-development, that skill of how to use the appliance. And is it really the appliance that's treating the patient, or is it you, doctor? Yeah. And then is it the hygienist? The hygienist has the best opportunity to really meet the, the personal, interpersonal needs of the patient. They know if this patient's flossing every day or not flossing every day. They mm. know if this patient, you know, isn't the best at brushing. So why put them in a position where they put and bond these brackets and wires onto their teeth, knowing for full well they're going to get decalcification? Right, right. Or worse, right. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's kind of where it comes from. And it, it's like, yeah, it, it's the comfort level. Are they comfortable yeah. with it? Or are they not comfortable with it? And as our role at Dent Supply Serona with Sure Smiles, how do we help people get more comfortable with aligner therapy? Because let's face it, nobody wants to walk around with a mouthful of braces at 40. <laughs> they don't. They don't. I mean, there's, I don't want to say it's the same as, you know, those teens, like your, your daughter, but, you know, there's a lot of social stigma as an adult getting braces. You know, my brother just went through, you know, full, you know, braces as well as an adult. And, you know, he's, I think he's 42 or whatever. He's 80s for as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> my older brother. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's this whole, you know, I don't, it's not, it shouldn't be embarrassing, but it is, there's a social stigma behind it. I want to get into the clinical th components of this in just a few minutes. We're going to maybe walk through several ideas for you hygienists and, and doctors who are listening. But before we get into that though, I do want to maybe talk a little bit about, and, and normally I put this at the end of the episode, but I want, I really want people to have the tools to implement if they, if they love what they're hearing to implement this technology into their practice. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be backwards, but we're going to start there. If we can talk about if someone hears how amazing this is, what steps do they need to go to and what equipment, what protocols, what things do they need to be uh, have into their practice? Okay. So we at Dent Supply Serena do not accept PVS or alginate impressions. So we need some form of STL file or digital scan. And it's mm -hmm. because the intimacy and the fit of these aligners on everybody's teeth. And also we have a component to our aligner that it goes up into the soft tissue a little bit up to two millimeters. And so that soft tissue from a scanner has a tendency to not get pushed by the PVS or get pushed. So when you scan it, it's actual. 
And the reason why we go up there is because then we can have less attachments or really helping and moving some other things, which as an adult, I don't want a bunch of bumps on my teeth. And so there's some things, if I want a discreet way of doing it, we need an STL file. One, they fit better. They clinically result better that way. The other thing is, is we need a series of photos. We need facial photos because for us, we will actually give you, we call it a smile assessment or smile design where the patient has their smile face in mm-hmm. inside the software. And we will actually move the teeth in our treatment planning and our three-dimensional treatment planning. Then we'll inset those with what we call global orientation to the face. And then the patient mm-hmm. can then see the before and afters. And then, nice. and then the last thing is, is of course, extra, some sort of films, whether it be CBCT, Bite Wings, Pano, Ceph. If you're going to do anything with bone, we got to have that. So sure. you can have any scanner. Densply Serona's SureSmile allows from, it's agnostic. We will take any scanner. We now take open resource for any CBCT. So any of those systems, as long as you can export and control the file in an STL fashion, you can submit mm. to us. And then, of course, you can take the photos off your phone. You can take them off an iPad. You can take them off your fancy cameras and your practices. Um, <laughs> and then you have to have a, a, a partnership with Densply Serona to have credentials and access. And kind of going back to where you were starting is that patient, that chair side patient education is what's so important. Malocclusion doesn't sneak up on people. Mm-hmm. It eventually happens. Are we monitoring this in a way that we can then share chair side with the patient and educate them on what we see in the changes? So whether it's a scan today and looking at that lower anterior crowding, spinning the monitor around and showing Jane, who's come to you for the last 15 years, that, oh, Jane, I'm starting to see these lower teeth starting to really bind up and crowd. Here's where you notice me scaling a lot more. I'm starting to be concerned because it's going to get worse. And then you can always take a photo if you can't use, if you don't have a scanner handy, you can always take a photo, but engaging that chair side shoulder to shoulder education with the patient on what you as a hygienist see every day, and then taking them a little bit farther down the road in the conversation, we can fix it today. We can fix it without using braces, and we can also fix it shorter period of time now, or we can at least put a retainer on you so it doesn't progress. Which would you prefer? Hmm. Because let's face it, I mean, you're a hygienist. What did you see in the mouth? What was the usually first series of teeth that fail? It's usually those first molars, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those are the longest ones in your mouth. They have the most traumatic occlusion. And yet we don't talk about it enough. And then they get endo. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, now we're going to lead up to an implant. Mm-hmm. So it's like how yeah. from, from the hygiene chair, it's a great opportunity to have a conversation. Again, shoulder to shoulder, show them what you see. Because they don't mm-hmm. see anything past the cuspids half the time. They don't right. know that right. the arch is supposed to be arch form, is supposed to be round and hued. They don't know that the buccal corridor is collapsing. And so the more we can educate them and relate that to them and it's theirs and give mm-hmm. them an opportunity to make educated choices by saying, hey, we don't have to do it with braces. We can do something with a more discreet approach. Yeah, yeah, I, which, which I love. And I think that you know, you're speaking to the heart of a lot of hygienists here. We, we have been used to this instant gratification you know, through you see calculus, you remove it, boom, you feel good about it. You see redness and inflammation, you you know, provide therapy and boom. I mean, almost by the end of the appointment, it's, it's done. And so now we're having that next level, that next step that we can offer them so we can continue to have that kind of fulfillment or gratification. And especially if we can use the software to see the rendering of what, you know, the after is going to be like, that's again, boom, instant gratification. This is, this is all speaking very much to hygienists. I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, let's talk about scanning for just a quick second though, because I feel like, you know, you said that you're agnostic. Although you're agnostic as far as what scanner you use, is there a preference of what you use? And follow-up question to that, what are the common, I don't say complaints that your your lab people <laughs> find, but like what are the obstacles that are generally found from, from your techs? Sure. So let me flip that on you just a smidge, and then we can continue on with answering your question. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when now for having a digital scanner in every office. Hmm. Because... It's portable, it's fast, it's easy, it's more accurate. The inhibition has been in the past is the cost. It's a significant cost. It's, you know, it's, it's capital equipment. However, there's pricings out there that have brought things down, but the utility of each device has scope. So our system is called Prime Scan. It's an iOS system and it can be tied with our CEREC system where you can mill and do other things in office. But we come from a space of immediate patient education chair side immediate capture of any form of dentition and soft tissue. And so our camera 
is meant to do edentulous scans. It's meant to scan partials. It's meant to scan all kinds of materials without powder. Where in the past, wow. you know, how can we make it more convenient and comfortable for the patient? Yeah. And then how do we make it quicker? Most hygienists have what, 45 to 60 minutes? And so we've got to make that a faster act, a capture of that information. We're mm -hmm. going to a space and imagine a world where every hygienist and every doctor has at their operatory some sort of digital iOS scanner. And they took once a year a digital footprint of every patient. And then there's software for the next visit in six months to show you the differences in soft tissue, differences in hard tissue, and differences in orthodontic movement. We have that today with a software called Aura Check, and they will literally run an algorithm to show the patient chair side as long as you're comparing two different scans where the differences are. So now that belief system with the patient is, oh, you're telling me to my ear as I'm laid back and I'm, I'm inclined and you know, I'm doing all these things. Now you can actually bring them up, set them up, show them, and this is legitimately their mouth, and there's a different belief system. And then that whole idea of not selling anything is a educating process. And you all are so compassionate about the people and want, and they, you do amazing jobs of bringing them back year over year and month over month that they, they believe you, they trust you, they value your thoughts. But mm -hmm. this is just another piece of solidifying what they heard you say. Now they can see it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is a soft tissue space. You guys all know this when you guys do deep root planning and all that stuff, it's, it's hard because you have to bring them in routine, routine. Are we really solving the problem or are we just fixing the symptoms? Yeah. And yeah. so that is a whole nother venture Absolutely. that, you know, the structures of my house are falling down, but the roof's still standing. Well, wait a minute. Everything <laughs> else is falling down around it. But sometimes it yeah. takes that visual piece. I mean, what? 80% of us are visual learners. Yeah. So whether it's a photo, whether it's a scanner, whether it's whatever, how can we visually show them? and engage them in that discovery. So going back to the scanners, speed of use, getting in and out of that patient's mouth as quickly as possible with the least amount of bumping and you know rolling around and doing all crazy stuff, but also the importance of being able to scan quickly and efficiently, capturing data that you need. Maybe you want to do, maybe the doctor wants to do an implant years from now and wants to mm -hmm. set that up. So the data that you have from that point of origin is important to collect. And then also the ability to go over all types of materials in the mouth. Amalgam, gold, silver, stainless steel. I mean, you know, Emacs, zirconia. I mean, it's hard sometimes to capture that with an old style scanner. Mm -hmm. So, and then do it in a timely fashion. Yeah, yeah. So, what are the complications that the lab sees generally? What, are, what, are, where are they missing the data from these scans, or are they not? Is everything perfect? And no, it's so, awesome. So, for us today, <laughs> if you if we looked at yesterday, yesterday was Friday. If we looked at yesterday's results, we have eight percent scan rejections, and it's usually okay. scan path. Meaning what? Meaning when they flow through the mouth with the scanner, that there's some sort. It's not a smooth, easy flow. There's usually these pauses and these jumps in the segments. And it almost looks like as if you were looking at a double impression on a PVS or an alginate impression. Mm, so you get yeah. these little ripples. The other thing is, is the distal of the molars, the last molar. Yeah. Everybody yeah. misses those. That's a tough place. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard. Yeah. So, and then you've got saliva pulling and you've probably got them tipped back and you know, there's all sorts of things. And then the last thing is, is probably in the interproximals because those aligners fit so intimately and apply forces in the interproximals. Sometimes we miss that and it creates not only a black triangle in the imagery, but it also doesn't allow the plastic to embrace that tooth at that space. Yeah, I love it. So, okay, so let's, um, okay, real quick, one more, sorry, one more little side. This is the podcast. I do all sorts of little side it's thoughts. Awesome. Okay, so um, this is actually, I just want to address the hygienists that are listening right now, because I think when we are asked to do yet one more thing in our 45 to 60 minutes, as you said, this, this can be something that, you know, we're going to instantly want to reject ourselves. Like we're not going to want to do it because we don't have enough time. We have all this other stuff to do, but I like where you were talking about, like the implications of the data collection that we're getting is more than just for this clear liner. It is, you know, potentially early interventions for, you know, there's abfraction and occlusal trauma and things like that. Heaven forbid we need to use it for forensics, you know, in the future, mm -hmm. we have all of that as an ability as well. I think, you know, there's so much more to this data collection that I just implore all the hygienists listening that, hey, let's be futuristic thinking. <laughs> like, let's not, let's not be in the moment now, but let's think about what we're doing for the greater good. Okay, 
So now let's get into the, the clinical assessment phase. So if we're doing sure smile for our patient, you know, Jane, as you said, patient, patient Jane, which by the way, is not a common name that we use for, for hygiene. It's always Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones or whatever. <laughs> Anyways. So Jane's in our chair. And what are the things that we need to do to assess to make sure that she's going to be a good candidate for clear liner therapy? Yeah. Keeping it as simple as possible. Arch form is the first and foremost. Is there any place in the arch upper and lower that is collapsed? that is starting to come together or ravel. The patients don't understand that it's supposed to be that big, you beautiful arch. A lot of times it's in that buccal corridor. It looks like it got cinched in. They're starting to incline. They're starting to tip palatally. The second thing would be is especially that lower anterior. We have a funny saying in the ortho space that shift happens. And it's usually in that lower anterior. There's an F in there, There's guys. a shift happens. <laughs> and so, you know, looking at that lower anterior of Jane, who's a 45-year-old woman, who's starting to have these interproximals that are supposed to be side by side and they're starting to overlap, it's not going to solve itself. Do we intercept now with less time and less cost or do we allow it to continue? And then that tooth gets pushed completely out of alignment. Then it gets extracted. Then we talk about an implant. Then we talk, you know, it, it just keeps going down the road. So arch yeah. form, lower anterior, and then exactly what you said where those ab fractions are. You guys see ab fractions all the time. Do mm -hmm. we really assess the cause of the ab fraction? What caused that notching of that tooth? Is it traumatic occlusion from the lower or the opposing arch? Almost always. Yeah. Yeah. And right. and what happens when we put composite on it? The doctors put a composite on it and it pops out, like pops out, pops out, pops out. So, mm -hmm. and you know, and then they start brushing harder and then they start, you know, thinking things going, and it's sensitive. I mean, there's just so many things, but have we really addressed the occlusion that caused it and could occlusion have caused it? And that's a, that's a great way to either take photos with articulating paper so you can see it, or maybe it's a habit, or doing a scan. Most of the scanners will show occlusal grams, and right. you can show that heavy occlusion. Because usually there's a flattening of a molar next to it. And if we're really in a space where we want to protect and preserve those teeth for the rest of this patient's life, we need to have those hard conversations from the hygiene team. Can we, can we try and visualize for our, the listeners, the occlusal gram? Yeah. Or occlusion, you call it occlusion gram? Well, or ours, gram? ours is just it? an occlusal, um, it looks kind of like a map, a heat map or weather map. And so let's say like the heat map. Yeah. yeah. Like so you one. show the, you scan the upper arch and you show, you scan the lower arch on our system and then you scan their bite and mm. granite, you know, wherever you put their bite or, you know, whatever. So then you se we separate the arch. And we'll show the upper arch usually first, and it'll show these little hot points, red. Somebody sees and they go, oh my gosh, that looks so, that's bad, right? That's where the tornadoes are. <laughs> and you, you kind of have to simplify it and say, here's where you're making the heaviest occlusion. And it's always, almost always in the, the posterior. And you'll get a few random ones in the anterior, like eight, eights colliding and, you, and there, there's a chip there. I mean, you can go over so many reasons as to why, right? Yeah. And then you show the lower and you show where those sensitive spots are for heavy occlusion. And then you start moving up from there. You can say, oh, look, these two teeth have this heavy red mark. I'm also noticing this is the same area or the same quadrant that you have your ab fraction and now you've got recession, you've got clefting. Mm -hmm. So there's always a hard tissue response resulting from a soft tissue response. So how do we break that down? And how do we educate the patient on what we know and what we know is going to happen? Because it's, mm -hmm. you're, and I say we collectively as all of us, I'm not a hygienist, but I get so excited about it because you guys <laughs> have this, this situation every day, eight to seven times a day that is so intimate and such an mm -hmm. opportunity to, to teach people what's going on in their mouth and then have a partnership where they can own the change. Yeah. Well, look, you can be an honorary hygienist <laughs> for the day. It's, it's fine. Anyone that's passionate about taking care of people and their, and their dentition, you can be a part of it. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so let me ask about contraindications. Like what are the, who are the people that just like, we cannot be doing clear liner therapy? On? Yeah. So a couple of good things. We can shut down any tooth. If there's an implant there, if there's a lot of mobility, we can shut down any tooth or change the speeds of the movement or stop the movement. However, people on like Fosamax and things like that, there's usually some hesitations towards going in, into occlusion or into um, orthodontics. So that's up to the doctor and the team to treat. 
really the only people that really have a hardship with aligner therapy um, because there's no BPHs, there's no latex, there's nothing in it. It's the thermal plastic meant to be in the mouth. There's really no, mm, maybe some more severity, some skeletal cases again, but it goes back to who's treating them. Maybe it's limitations on what the doctor feels comfortable in treating right now. Anybody, I mean, there's some, there's patients four years old using aligners for pre-sleep and opening up the arches. And then there's people that are 92 that are, they're only treating the lower anterior. So I'd hate to say that everybody's off the table for them. It really depends on the skill of the treatment and who's treating them and the other appliances, if they want to do hybrids and stuff like that to engage in that treatment. Early on, I was, I, I participated a lot in Dentaltown. I'm not sure if you mm-hmm. know what Dentaltown mm-hmm. is, but like, you know, we, it was such a great place. And it still is a great place, I think, for a lot of people to kind of learn about just the vastness that is dentistry. Because we think about dentistry as being so simple. You know, you, you know your, your bread and butter dentistry, you put fillings in, you do this, you do that. One of the things that I learned there that actually became kind of a little bit annoying until I understood it was almost exactly what you're talking about right now. They would say, well, in my hands, this is how I do it. In my hands, this is how I do it. And we, I'll be honest, we didn't make a joke out of that. <laughs> it was always a big joke. But I think the public, but also I think us as dental auxiliary and you know, hygienists and professionals, we would love to think that our doctors can do anything, that they have the degree, they have the training, so they can just do it. And so I'm really glad that you've said this multiple times about Hey, we need to make sure that the right people are doing the right things. It's not that, that the technology doesn't work. It's the people that are you know, manipulating the technology. So thank you for, for that reminder. Sure. Okay. So I want to, okay, we've assessed the patient then. One of the hardest parts I think for hygienists specifically is going over, like going over treatment plans. We are great at education, like you mentioned, but maybe what are some, some thoughts or some, some tips or whatever that we can get that maybe even bringing up the fact that they need braces or they need a clear line of therapy. Like how do we even bridge that? Yeah, that's, we get that question a lot. So being a maturing female, a lot of times it would be a joke if somebody brought up to me, okay, great. Ortho at 52. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And some people get cheeky with it in the chair and they're like, Hey, Heather, listen, you know what? I had so much lower anterior crowding on my lower and he did. He said, he said, listen, we got to talk about this and it might not seem weird. It's going to seem weird. It might not seem normal, but we really need to put them in better alignment. The other thing is, is I've heard people do really well is listen, clinical studies have shown that if we put your teeth in proper occlusion, that they'll last you longer. I have other people that really get, you know, kind of some kind of fun with it. And they're like, you know, how long do you want to keep these? Because it's my job as your dental professional, and you see me often, it's my job to yeah. keep them there as long as you want to care for them and wear them. <laughs> so yeah. um, the other thing is, is listen, here's what I'm seeing today. I see you every six months. Here's what I see today. Show them. I'm concerned because if we don't do something with this, we used to teach them, you know, talk about the problem, identify the consequences if it goes untreated, and provide them mm-hmm. solutions. So mm-hmm. if, we don't talk, if we don't talk about this today, it's going to get worse. These don't That's solve right. themselves and maybe give them a couple little anecdotal things and then say, listen, the great thing is, is we can treat you here without using brackets and wires. We can do it with clear aligners. Is it all right if I have the doctor talk to you a little bit more about that? Love it. I mean, that's simple. It's anyone can use either any of these. Yeah. We just don't want to sell, right? We don't want to sell the patient, right. but also this is a big investment for them. How do we build that investment value? This isn't, mm-hmm. this isn't, you know, a $300 treatment. This can range anywhere from $3,500 to $5,500 to $6,500 treatment. And while they're thinking, great, I need this. Maybe I've done a good job and great, I need this. Then they hear Mm -hmm. that financial component of it. But gosh, what's the value of keeping your teeth or putting your teeth in better alignment for longevity of life? And Mm -hmm. that's where we have Mm -hmm. to bridge that gap. This isn't just a one and done little case. This is a longer period of time to be treated. And oftentimes it's more expensive. So we have to build that need, that medical need, and we have to build that medical capacity of how it's going to impact their life. And it is, it's life-changing. Yeah. Huge value there. And this is a sponsored episode by Dents by Serona. And so SureSmile is the, is the brand for clear line of therapy for Dents by Serona. And so I want to talk a little bit about the differences or what makes it, you know, easier, so to speak, to use SureSmile than, than maybe some other, um, 
other ones out that are out there. Yeah, thanks for asking. Not an original space that's been out. Uh, Liner Therapy's been out there for decades. What we have in our hands is we have a digital lab team who literally reviews every therapeutic model or records that you send in, and they actually set up the treatment plan based on the doctor's prescription. And they also know what are plausible results. So we have less refinements when paired with our team in the treatment planning. So that way the doctor gives a more reliable results in a timely fashion. So if the doctor says, hey, you know what? We're going to be treating this in like six to nine months. It doesn't go 12 to 15. 50% of the time it's right on within you know three or four aligners. We use Essex Ace Plastic, which we own as a company, and we manufacture each one of these aligner sets. We print a model, and then we make an Essex suck down for each stage of the aligner therapy. So really intimate fitting. That's why we want the STL file from a digital scanner. And then the other thing is, is we have a lot of variability in the clinical piece. We can go high up into the soft tissue up to two millimeters to control the tooth more, and we have the less propensity to put attachments. So there's a lot of form and function, but clinically you can get more done with these aligners in a more timely fashion. And then we have the team and support to help the doctor get there, especially if they're just dipping their toes into the water with orthodontics. They need that extra support clinically to show them what good looks like and how to get there reliably. That's so nice. There've been so many doctors that I've worked with that, you know, they're either relatively new grads or even new grads who are, I don't want to say afraid to jump into something they don't know, but maybe they're just still working on their speed or maybe they're working on their endo or whatever. And having someone there to kind of help guide them through it, I think is really good because it'll, it's not telling the doctor what to do. It's saying, doctor, consider these things that you've already learned. This is how we're implementing those things. Just reminding them. So I like that education. We've hit education a lot in this little episode. If someone were to want more training, what does Dense by Serona have to offer as far as, you know, places they can, you know, resources? Sure. We try to meet people on where they like the medium best. We have on demand. So we have what's called SureSmileU.com. Once you join SureSmile, you get access and credential to utilize that. I believe there's over 2000 hours of CE. Good for anybody in the practice. So if you're an on-demander, you want to spend your weekends going online and doing it that way, you can. We also believe that there's a component of people that want to come and attend live. We have a partnership today with the CDOCS courses down in Arizona, as well as in Charlotte. And we have a level one and a level two orthodontic course that we partner with. And we're in the development stages and we actually host our first one yesterday of a live event in our Charlotte location where we brought in 22 folks. We taught them how to take the proper scan. We taught them how to do the photos. We taught them how to assess for case assessment. And then we taught them on how to submit and go through the software and process. So we're very diverse in how we meet those people and how they want to learn. We are also in the process of creating an online mentorship and really creating a community in this space because not everybody wants to air out that they don't know how to treat a patient with aligner therapy <laughs> in front of 50 of their closest, not closest friends. That's right. So That's right. we're working on this process now and we're testing it where a clinician can get on the phone and digitally join by a virtual case and talk about the process and the steps and the clinical options. So we're trying to meet everybody where they need to be in order to learn the best. And mm-hmm. that's where our waterfall of reps and our technology service people and our, our care team, they will all meet those doctors where they need to be. It's just, we need to ask the right questions and helping them get there and finding out what's best for them. Not to put you on the spot too much again, again, uh, of those 22 people that met, how many of them were team members? Surprisingly more team members than doctors. We had, Ooh, we had like seven, we had seven doctors register yesterday in a room of a nine were doctors. Two other ones were already customers and the rest was team members. And it was interesting to see when we were up on the stage and talking about certain processes, the team members, their heads are all bobbing. Yeah. And they're writing notes. And, <laughs> and, and then the doctors are looking at them like, I don't know. And then later we went upstairs to the Academy and we put the scanner in the doctor's hands and the doctors were bumbling around and trying to figure it out. And then the team That's members right. would grab the scanner and they're like, we've got this. Go, go sit down. Yeah. Go do what you do. Yeah. And it's great yeah. because a lot of times there's some doctors that are hesitant towards allowing that delegation of those processes. We had one doctor tell us yesterday, I'm just better at it. Well, you know what? Time for you to go be better at diagnosing and treating and let yes. this person be better at scanning. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, that makes me really smile a lot. So I appreciate that. <laughs> so, I mean, everyone listen, if, if you're interested in any one of these, you know, opportunities, 
in person webinar, like whatever, make sure you guys all reach out where, where should they be reaching out to? Yeah. Good question. So they can reach out to suresmile.com and then they can go in as a doctor or they can learn more information. If they learn more information, they scroll down on any sheet. They can contact us directly. We have internal lead sources that we do. They can always reach out to the, the dense ply salon or representative that they see all the time, whether it be their endo, their implant, their technology, they can ask them who the local sure smile specialist is. We have a very good collaborative team effort when it comes to the local areas. And we can actually have that sure smile specialist come out to them and come and meet them and kind of give them some information on what they have. We also have major campaigns right now. I think you can join sure smile for like some crazy number of $49 and it gives you the credentials and access to that sure smile you that I mentioned all that learning platform. You can also have start submitting aligners, but the most important thing that I always think, cause I think profitability, do we all do this for free? No, but you can get 50% off all your cases for a certain period of time. Kind of like your initial onboarding, you get 50% sure, sure. off. So it's a great way to get somebody on the team in treatment, somebody at home, family and friends, and really test and see how it works in your hands and see if it's a space that you like to. We know statistically right now with the revenue dollars that each doctor is bringing to the practice, aligner therapy is vacillating anywhere between 5 and 10%. And there's so much more runway there. You know, top three procedures right now are implants, endo, and ortho. Seven out of 10 general dentists are providing ortho with aligner therapy. They're filling that and making that percentage up higher. So, I mean, average case is what, $4,000, dollars $5, That could be somebody's goal per day. Wow. That's incredible. Heather, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one bringing the best of dental knowledge and we do it all with ease we cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease we're gonna do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist a tale of two hygienists